Brothers and sisters in Christ, did you make a New Year's resolution this year? How's it going so far? I, I made one. I decided that this is the year that I'm going to start eating breakfast every morning. Every time I tell somebody I'm not a breakfast eater, I get shamed. It's the most important meal of the day, they say. Well, this is the year. And I'm getting married in June, so I decided I should probably start getting in the gym pretty soon, start getting a little bit more muscular. But I don't know that, um, I don't know that saying I'm going to start working out next week really counts as a New Year's resolution. Did you make a New Year's resolution? Show of hands, who did? How's it going so far? Forbes Health. Forbes Health conducted a survey recently, and what they found is that on average, New Year's resolutions last about three and a half months. And honestly, I was surprised that it was even that long. I think that we can get so excited about all the potential that a New Year holds for greatness, for great things. We, we start scrolling through Facebook and Instagram or Twitter, and we see pictures of people that are just rocking it. They've got the perfect morning routine or all these awesome habits. And, and we see a new year ahead of us and we, we start to think to ourselves, if I could just do X, my life would be so much happier. If my, if my career, if my job was just a little bit more Y, then I'd have so much more time to do the things that I love. And so we start to build up the store of dreams of how great the next year could be. And so we swing for the fences with our New Year's resolutions and set them high. And then we inevitably fall short, apparently, on average, after three and a half months. Maybe some of you have lived through enough of your own bad resolutions in the past that, that you, you're thinking to yourself, no way, I don't do that anymore. All New Year's is for me now is the time when I have to start writing a different number when I write the date on things. <laughs> That's fine. This, this text for this morning is not a New Year's text, and this is not going to be a New Year's sermon. But... In Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, he says some very, very big things about new beginnings. Things that, that you and I need to sort out as Christians who are seeking Christ in his kingdom. You see, that some of the things Paul says in our text for this morning are bigger and more challenging than any New Year's resolution that I've ever heard of. There's a few things, a few things that he says. He says, we are Christ's ambassadors. Wow. He says, he goes on and he, sa he says, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. Whoa. And as if that already wasn't more than we could chew, in the next verse, he brings it home with, become the righteousness of God. How many of you have that on your list of New Year's resolutions? Become the righteousness of God. My goodness, are you sweating yet? <laughs> Pump the brakes, Paul. All I wanted to do this year was eat breakfast. <laughs> and you want me to become righteousness? To be an ambassador for Jesus Christ? <laughs> to be reconciled to God? It's a lot to ask of someone like me. But Paul doesn't leave us hanging this morning. In, in the six preceding verses, the ones that I just highlighted for you, he breaks it all down nicely for us. And so that's what we're going to talk about. That's where Paul's going to take us today. He's going to explain to us how we have a great calling from a gracious God, one that we're not going to want to pass up in 2024. Paul starts it off in verses 14 and 15 by saying, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Have you noticed that humans are obsessed with survival? I'm pretty obsessed with Survivor, the CBS show. Anyone else? Have you, have you seen this show? It's been running for over 20 years and 45 seasons. Contestants are called on to outwit and outplay and outlast. They, they have to live in the wilderness, but they also have to compete in challenges to try to vote each other off the island. Man, it's such a good show. It's one of a few of its kind that have, that have been on, on, on television over the last few years where, where we get to sit on our couches at home where it's cozy and safe and watch people just absolutely suffer in the elements. 
And it's entertaining because we're obsessed with survival. People, people all over the world, millions of people, have made careers out of, out of growing and planting and, and, and preparing food, food that keeps us waking up every single morning. And we spend countless hours of every year stuffing that food into our mouths. We are obsessed with survival. We even make hobbies and professions out of it. The Bee Gees. The Bee Gees have been making four generations of human beings boogie to their hit songs, Staying Alive. We are obsessed with survival. When we're not trying to do it, we're talking about it. We're singing about it. We are obsessed with survival. But, but Paul says in verse 14 that when one died, Jesus... All died with him. All died with him. Is that cause for celebration? Yes. Yes, it absolutely is. Jesus himself said in John chapter 12, Very truly I tell you, Jesus said, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. It produces, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Well, anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Jesus said that. We are by nature obsessed with survival, but that's not all. We're obsessed with ourselves. From the moment that we wake up in the morning, our every thought is centered on me, me, me. The alarm goes off and you think to yourself, man, could I use some extra sleep? Yes, of course I could, so you snooze it a few times. Your stomach starts to growl and you think, oh, I'm starving. I haven't eaten in like 12 hours. What am I going to eat for breakfast? How can I numb my mind before I even rise to seize the day, scrolling on the internet, whatever it is. And when we get up from bed, it doesn't get any better. How can I climb the corporate chain today? Who do I have to step on to get one step further? Who said who about who? And who can I tell it to? Why am I not happy? Why am I not fulfilled? Why am I not satisfied? I, I, me, me, my, mine. You know the drill. It's what you do. It's what I do. But Paul says, he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Christ invites you to die so that you can live, so that you can step in to the great calling that he so graciously places on your life. When he died a sinner's death, he made sure that you would never need to. We're celebrating the baptism of Jesus today on your baptism day. That sinful, selfish, old self was drowned. It was drowned in that baptismal font. And Jesus changed you. He changed your life. He gave you something to live for, for him. And he changed your eternity. But we'll get there. For now, we're going to keep reading because Paul is going to talk about your present. He says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. My friends, there's, there's one being in the history of time and space who can reconcile you to God. And that's God himself. You see, reconciliation, it's, it's the restoring of, of, of good relations between two parties. In any situation that involves God and man and reconciliation is a situation in which God is changing someone from the inside out. And that's exactly what he's done for you. In his omniscience, he, he looks at you and he sees Everything you've ever done, good and bad, he sees every sin you've ever committed, the things that you've never told anyone about, he knows. He sees it. But in the same moment, he sees Jesus. 
he sees Jesus, the very personification of the fact that he has decided not to count any of those sins against you. He sees Jesus. In a cosmic miracle of grace, Christ's payment for sin on the cross, his payment of the debt that was yours, is credited to your account. And Paul says, as a result, you're going to see the world completely differently. It's really easy to see the world, to see people with the eyes of a man, with the eyes of a human. Especially, I've found, when you're looking at family. I don't know you personally, but I know myself, I know my family, and, and I'd be willing to bet that, that many of you, before you even set foot on church property this morning, that somebody that's sitting in the pew next to you found a way to get under your skin. Maybe it was the button that they just know how to push, the, the words that they know to use just to get on your nerves a little bit, and they succeeded. Or maybe it's the age-old conundrum that that church happens at the same time every single Sunday, but that doesn't change the fact that that person is always running late on Sunday morning. doesn't matter how early the alarm goes off, how early breakfast is on the table. I'm seeing sideways glances in the pews right now, guys. I think I, I, think I nailed it. Or maybe it's not somebody at home. Maybe it's, maybe it's somebody at work. It's that one coworker that does things in all the ways that you don't want them to do things. It, they, they say too much or too little at all the wrong times. And man, life would be easier if they just weren't around. But that's not how you see things anymore. You don't see things with a, with a worldly point of view. You see them with the eyes of Christ. Paul says, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. He says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. He says, God has committed to you the message of reconciliation. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? That means even if they never change, even if they never change, you have. You've been changed. You have died with Christ so that you can live for him you see, the world with, you see the world with the eyes of a Savior who died so that he can live for you. You see them with the eyes of a Savior that, that looks at that coworker. He looks at him and he says, that one was worth dying for. He looks at her and says, she is so, so precious to me. That's how you see the world now. You see the world with the eyes of a Savior who could, who could snap his fingers and blot out the mistake that was the human race in a second. But he chooses to love it instead. Christ reconciled us to himself. He gave his life just to be near you. And he's given us this message in his grace, this message of reconciliation. And it's our great calling from our gracious God to carry, to carry this message to our families and our neighbors and our co-workers. It's our calling to wear reconciliation on our sleeve so that everyone can see it. So that they can see that God is not far away. God is not waiting for you to clean up your act. God is here. He's here now. He gave up everything to be near you because it, he, it's what he wanted more than anything in the whole world, more than life itself. And Paul says he wants you. He wants you as his righteous ambassadors. Paul says we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And look, we're right back where we started. We have a great calling from a gracious God. We have a great calling from a gracious God at the start of a new year when ambitions are high and we've got all these new goals and aspirations for a fresh start. We've got a great calling from a gracious God. Later this year when you're in the darkest valley and hope is slipping from view and you can barely remember what goodness feels like at all. You have a great calling from a gracious God. And every single day in between, you are called. It's been placed on your heart. He wants you. 
We are Christ's ambassadors. We, we are the lost sheep that he left the fold to bring back to the fold. And now he's given us the job. He's hired us as under-shepherds for our time here on earth to go get more lost sheep. But how do we do it? Why, why, why does Paul command us to be reconciled to God? Didn't Jesus already make sure that that was paid in full, that that was done? Yes. Christ's work was completed the day that he walked out of that grave alive. And all, all the sin that was ours, that whole debt that rested on our shoulders was placed squarely on his when he was on the cross. And, and in the same way, the robe of righteousness that he won that day, the white clean robe of, of purity and holiness, he places that on your shoulders. I see you all wore yours today. But there's a world out there full of people that you know them. And they are hungering and thirsting for a Savior who already died to save them. And they just don't know it yet. And so Paul is calling Christ's ambassadors to get to work. To put on that robe of righteousness and walk out those doors to seek the Lord where he may be found. He's calling for us to steep ourselves in this message of reconciliation. And the message of all that Christ has done for us. He's calling for us to saturate our lives with the gospel in the word and sacrament, to show up to church on Sunday, to be faithful, to be in the word throughout the week, to participate in the sacraments, to put on our uniform as Christ's ambassadors. Not because you have to do any of this, but because you need it more than you need air in your lungs. So soak it in. And once you've, once you've been filled to the brim with all of the goodness that Christ has for you, fill yourself up with the hope that comes from knowing that you have died with Christ and now you live anew with him. Be filled to the brim with the inexpressible joy that comes from knowing that you, a human being, are at peace with your God, with your creator. Put on that that uniform of Christ's ambassadors, your white robe of righteousness, won for you by your Savior. And then step out into the world that is thirsting for living water and overflow. Amen.